Well, it's a privilege to be here at Trinity Chapel. I've sat where you sat for many years, and somebody asked me this morning, have you ever preached in chapel before? I said, no, I, I was just kept in the labs all these years. So this is my first time stepping up here. But would you, would you join me for a brief prayer? Father, we're grateful for the tremendous privilege to be here. This morning, we pray that you would use your word to make a difference in our lives so that when we leave these doors, we leave different than the way we walked in. We pray that you would use your word to not just trouble us, but transform us, not just challenge us, but to change us. Only you can do that work, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I do count it a privilege to be here at TED's, and I hope you do too. Uh, we have such wonderful staff and faculty, professors, teachers, and, and students. Uh, so much gifting. Uh, there's awards and scholarships and uh, people serving in chapel. You see gifts galore. And you may feel that you're at TED's and maybe you're not the most gifted of the bunch, just by virtue of being here, you're incredibly gifted and entrusted with a great responsibility. But you can learn all your skills and your ministry how-tos. You can learn how to research and make good arguments. But if you le don't learn obedience, you're going to wreak havoc in your life. It doesn't matter how much skill you have, how much ministry prominence you get, how many hits on your YouTube channel. If you don't have basic obedience, you're going to make a mess of things. In fact, the skills and the strengths that you have coupled with your disobedience will wreak greater disaster than if you didn't have those skills and strengths. A gifted Christian who's an immature Christian is a dangerous Christian. And the ante is up when you have a minister who's an immature minister, and that minister is a danger to the church, to the community, to their own families, to their own lives. How so? You know the story of Samson, right? The text that was read for us is a small portion in Samson's, Samson Part 1. There's a sequel. A very capable preacher will handle the sequel next week. The story of Samson starts out with a really high calling. Samson, opening verses in chapter 13, he's, he's born to save Israel. He's not plucked randomly from somewhere else. We get his story from the beginning. And he's to be a Nazarite for life, no drinking, no unclean things, no haircuts. And so this sets him apart. This is something special going on. In verse 24, we see that he's blessed by God before he even did anything. He's He's chosen, he's set apart, he's blessed by God, and he's stirred by the Spirit, verse 25. And as we'll see, this doesn't mean displays of the fruit of the Spirit. This isn't Galatians 5 happening, but when the Spirit stirs him, it's for feats of great strength. And I think, as Lawson Younger mentioned uh, earlier in the semester when he was stealing some of my Samson thunder in his sermon, you see the movies and the comic books, and Samson is, you know, he's this humongous dude, and I think that's missing the point. I want to see a comic book of like a scrawny Samson, because his power had nothing to do with muscularity, had nothing to do with working out, had nothing to do with bench pressing. I think if you look at Samson, you're not supposed to go, well, yeah, I guess he can carry big old city gates on his back, but you're supposed to go, what in the world is going on right there, so that God can get the boasting rights. But Samson doesn't quite get it because his calling and his strength is not coupled with obedience. His calling and his strength is coupled with a rebellious heart. So just by way of reminder, you remember in Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 to 33, the Israelites are told what they're supposed to do in the land, and they're not supposed to wipe out half of the people and then make friends with the other half. They're not supposed to take out two-thirds of the people and then make friends with another third. They're not supposed to... Uh, dominate them, but just let them be present. No, completely blot them out because if you don't, they will be a snare to you. Your life will be ruined if you don't do it. Your life is ruined by disobedience. 
Interestingly, in that section in Exodus 23, they're promised that there will be no miscarriages, there will be no barrenness in the land. And then here you have a barren woman, and outside of, out of the barren woman comes this Savior. Even in the midst of their disobedience, God is going to do what He's going to do. So there's the context. There's, we have it. They're disobedience. They haven't pushed the people out of the land. They've made compromises with them. And then here's Samson, born to save them instead of saving them by pushing those people out. He wants to marry them. He has an autonomous heart. He's self-determined. And chapter 14, verse 2, we're told he sees one of the daughters, and he sees her and he likes her. And she's right in his eyes. We get that in verse 3. We get that in verse 7. This is what Israel's been doing in all these cycles. They see what's right in their own eyes, and they do what's right to them. They don't consult truth. They don't consult God. They looks right. And so they're stuck in this cycle that began in the garden, seeing something. It looks good to me to eat, and they bite. And so Samson, instead of rescuing Israel, he's just become the worst version of Israel. Rather than, than delivering them from the oppressors, he's become them. So what do we do with all this gifting and all the strength that he has? It's just a wreck of his life. I start out the sermon by saying, you're gifted and you have privilege being here. What's the answer? Drop out. What's the answer? A false version of humility? Oh, don't record my sermons. No, gifting is not the problem. The autonomous spirit is. But together, they're disastrous. Samson's not setting out to deliver Israel. He's doing this, what's right to him. And he's going to drag his authority down into his agenda with him. When you read chapter 14, you get this punctuation of going down. He went down in verse 1. He went down in verse 5. He went down in verse 7. In verse 10, Manoah goes down. He's dragging his parents down into this mess with him. Rather than honoring his authority, he dishonors them by dragging them down into this cycle, into this mess. He dishonors his parents by disrespecting them in verse 3, telling them what he wants, who he wants to marry. I don't want you to arrange it. I want to arrange it. And I'm not even going to choose someone from within the people group that I'm supposed to choose it. But the very people that I'm supposed to deliver us from, I want to marry them. And I think it was more than just lust. Verse 7, he goes down and talks with her and has a conversation, comma, and he likes her a lot. She's right in his eyes, not, not just physical lust, but he likes her. He likes her culture. He likes the gods they worship. He likes the people. Why would we wipe these people out? They're very marriable. Seems right to him. Not only does he dishonor his parents by dragging them into this cycle, but he defiles them. You remember the story of Samson and the lion. When he goes down with his father and mother to Timnah, they come to the vineyards in verse 5. Behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. In this particular moment, you put the pieces together, the parents aren't here. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion to pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother, see, so they don't know, what he had done. He goes down, talks to the woman. She's right in his eyes. Some days he returned to take her, verse 8, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. You remember the rules, no drinking, no unclean things, no haircuts. And here you have a carcass. Not supposed to touch it. Definitely not supposed to eat out of it. But he does. He sees a swarm of bees in the body of the lion. There's honey there. He scrapes it out with his hand. He goes on eating as he goes, defiling himself. And then he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he didn't tell them he scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. He's ruining everything. He's making a big mess. We've got to move fast through this. I mean, I was given 25 minutes for three chapters, so I've been pe asking people to pray for me. But, but, but you see this chain of events unfolding really quickly, and it leads to this wedding to this Philistine woman leads to a chain of disastrous events. It just gets worse. 
He starts with this stupid riddle. <laughs> and he makes a bet. Solve my riddle and I'll buy you a bunch of clothes. Some of you are like, well, that's pretty lame. I wouldn't take that bet. And some of you are like, oh, shopping spree. You know, <laughs> New outfit. 30 dudes took him up on it. Solve my riddle. I'll get you clothes. Can't solve my riddle. You owe me clothes. Okay. Whatever's right in his eyes, I guess. But then they cheat. They badger his wife and they ask her for the secret. She doesn't know the secret. She doesn't know the answer to the riddle. So she badgers Samson, verses 15 to 18. They get the answer. They come back and they go, oh, uh, we know the answer. What's, what's sweeter than honey? So he has to fulfill his obligation even though he says they cheated. He said, you, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have known the answer. And there's a lot of points to not follow Samson in, and that, that'd be one of them. You refer to your wife as a heifer. It's probably not a good start to your marriage. And he doesn't go to get the clothes that he owes. He doesn't go and just steal them off a rack. He murders people to get it. He's a murderer. So he goes off on a spirit-empowered slaughter. Why is the spirit empowering it? Well, we'll see that in a minute. God is doing what he's doing. He murders these people for garments. Then he goes away. He's upset. He comes back expecting his wife to just sit, be sitting there waiting for him. She's given away. His father says, why don't you take my younger daughter? She's prettier anyway. He's ticked off. He ties a bunch of foxes together with torches and destroys all their crops. That's 15, 1 through 5. Then the Philistines come back at him. This is a back and forth, back and forth, revenge, vengeance. Philistines burn his wife and father-in-law. They just burn them in 15, 6. Samson's angrier. So he goes on another killing spree and stacks them leg upon thigh. Just a big pile of bodies, a bunch of legs sticking out. Verses 7 through 8 of chapter 15. So the Philistines raid. The men of Judah gather 3,000 men to go get Samson out of a cave. They hand him over to the people. He breaks the ropes. He grabs a fresh jawbone and goes on another murderous rampage in verses 9 through 17 and leaves heaps upon heaps. One heap, two heap, three heap, four. Yeah, he likes his little ditties. But the fresh jawbone detail is not there to impress you with improvised weaponry, right? Wow, that's pretty skillful, a jawbone. But to shock you again with his blatant defilement and disobedience. Not, not a branch or a stick or his fist, like almost going out of his way to just use something that he's not supposed to be touching and use his, in his disobedience, use his power as given to him of the Lord. He's there to deliver the people from the oppressors, but he's, come the, he's become the oppressor. He's not killing them to fulfill Exodus 23. He's killing them for revenge. We get that clearly in 15.3, 15.7, 15.11. It's vengeance. It's revenge. But that's the same motivation as the Philistines in 15.10. He's them. He's bent on vengeance. He's bent on what he wants, when he wants it. There's a nowness to what he wants. Now I want her. She's right in my eyes. At the end of his life, he prays a prayer of defeat that he finally embraces the appropriateness, appropriateness of his death. But here it's presumptive. He, he comes to this point after all this killing, he's thirsty, he's tired, and he tells God, okay, you've, you've given me this victory, that, that's great, but what are you going to do now, let me die? Do we pray like that? You've given me all this education, given me these, all, these opportunities, and then you hit a rough patch in ministry. What are you going to do now, God, let this all fall apart? It's supposed to go like this. Do we kind of presume upon God giving us success in ministry? Are well, you giving me these strengths? What else are the strengths for? Why are we going through a hard time? It's supposed to go like ABC, and this is wrong. My concern is a rising generation of ministers who do things that are right in their own eyes. And they make a mess of things because they're actually pretty good at ministry. But they're, they're not concerned with preaching God's Word. They have a, speeches that are appended with verses, but it's little more, little more than TED Talks. They, they, make, they make leadership decisions based on the principles that they've garnered from the Harvard Business Review. 
more than they have God's Word. This increasing compromises with culture, following a bunch of non-sequiturs that riddle the church growth theory. If you build your ministry a certain way and you paint by these numbers, you will have a successful ministry. So you get somebody, maybe they got lucky, maybe it was skill, who knows, but they have a really, really big church. Publish a book, everybody's buying it. Everybody wants to go to the conference because they want a big church. And we leave God's Word behind for man-made principles. So our goal becomes to produce a ministry, to produce, to get a church to be what we want it to be. And so we start learning statistics and we start learning how to do chair arrangements to maximize seating. And we know how to do mailers and we know how to do, how to do campaigns. <laughs> We do things in ways that are right in our own eyes, and we become the producers. We're the actors. Stick to the script. Preach the Word. Don't get so high on your own success and largeness of your ministry. One day you'll look up and be convincing your congregation that they need to unhitch themselves from the Old Testament or something like that. Stick to the script. When we get stuck on this mode of producing our ministries and doing what we can to muscle up, we champion things that are attached to human skill. We lionize certain ministers. It's not because they're such great guys. You don't know them. It's because their churches are big. Because they sell a lot of books. And you want to be like them because you want a big church and you want to sell a lot of books. Now, what do we do? Erase our strengths? Let's not write books. Let's not have big churches. Oh, we're getting too big. Shut it down. No. The strengths aren't the problem. It's our self-determined spirits. It's when we think we're the producers, we're the ones doing this, and we presume upon God's grace in our ministries. Maybe you feel defeated. Maybe you feel like you recognize your own immaturities. You recognize your own failures. You wonder if there's a way forward. Maybe you already feel like you're drowning with other people succeeding around you and other people are getting straight A's and the other students in your program have found the, their original contributions so publishable. And you just feel like you're just saying the same thing everybody's always said. Maybe you feel like you're a failure because your standards are human productiveness and not God's Word. I think what we see that is encouraging here is God is not up in heaven biting His nails going, oh, Samson, he's messing everything up. Nope. God is accomplishing what He wants to accomplish even through Samson's disobedience. The person that loses, the party that loses in this scenario is Samson, not God. If you ever have anyone approach you and ask you, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I stay within God's will, would you please rid them of that nonsense? You think you can derail God's plan? <laughs> you, you think God has a purpose and a plan and you can like turn a knob and God's up there like, whoa, 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 where is, it, where is this going? No. You're not the producer. God is a God who works wonders. Chapter 13, verse 19. And I love the contrast between God and Samson because Samson is a secret keeper. He keeps the secret of the honey riddle. He keeps the secret of his hair in Samson part 2. But God is the real secret keeper, isn't he? If you look at chapter 14, verse 4, his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord. This, this whole thing that starts all the mess, 
him loving this woman from Timnah or liking her, feeling that she's right in his eyes and demanding her and wanting her and wanting to go get this and all the going down and going down and going down that's going to happen because of this desire. Verse 4 says, His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for the Lord was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Samson's a secret keeper, but so is God. He's got something up his sleeve. Samson's secrets are unraveled, and when Samson unravels his own secrets, he, his plans are foiled, but God's secrets are his own, and his plans are never foiled. What was from the Lord? Samson's own rebellion was from the Lord. It doesn't mean God is the direct cause, but it does mean it aligns with his purposes. Don't be a semi-deist where God is up there having sleepless nights because he's not sure what people are going to do next. No. Even the failures, even the rebellions, they align with his purpose and ultimately he gets done what he's going to get done. His gospel would be advanced even when we have knucklehead preachers in the pulpit. This doesn't give us a license to sin. We don't say, well, <laughs> God is sovereign. We just do whatever we want. We were just in, on Sunday at church. We are in Mark chapter 14. And Jesus announces his betrayer, Judas. And he says, oh, it's going as it is written. But woe unto him for playing the part. You may not be able to wrap your mind around it, but it's certainly not a free pass to sin. And it certainly doesn't mean that God's plans are suddenly unraveled and his purposes are suddenly foiled because we messed up. His plan goes forward. There's opportunity because deliverance has not disappeared because of disobedience. So disobedience reaps terrible consequences, but it doesn't re derail God's purpose. So what do we do? What is the author's own antidote to our proclivity to do what's right in our own eyes? Well, the need of a king. Now, here's my turn to take someone else's thunder, whoever's coming up in a couple. <laughs> Probably Steve. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's in 17.6, 21.25, and sandwiched in between them is a repetition in 18.1, 19.1. Four times. There wasn't a king. So what do they need? Well, they need a king. Not just any king, a particular king. And not just any particular king, but a king who would come and do what Samson couldn't do. We go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you going to go Samson is Jesus? How about this? Samson is Israel, but he's failed Israel. Jesus is the successful true Israel. Don't want to cheaply insert Jesus here. But if you leave here on your own strength going, okay, the point of the sermon is I have a lot of strength. What I need to do is obey. I, just, I need to obey. Without a king, you're going to end up doing what's right in your own eyes, and you're going to end up with a Samsonite ministry. You're not centered on your king. You don't have a moral compass. You're just bumping along, downloading the next Google chat hangout with the latest guru teaches you to manufacture your ministry. But if you're not going to leave here on your own strength, if you're not going to leave here with a Samsonite ministry, it's because you're going to leave here with a Christ-centered one. And allow this text to project forward to the answer. God's mystery isn't fully unveiled until the gospel is given to us. I don't want to stand up here and leave you in mystery as if we're still in mystery. The mystery has been given. We know the answer. We know the secret answer. We know the one who's coming, the one that solves it for us. And it's not leave here and obey better. It's leave here and obey him in him. It is our union with Christ that affords us the ability to obey. And we should pray like that. We should think like that. We should write sermons like that. If we don't, we'll be stepping all over ourselves. And what's waiting at the door is probably 
dark times, most of us are not going to have mega churches. If even subconsciously that's your bar for success, you, you need to stamp it out now. Is that, is that a biblical measure? What's, what's the number one question? Those of you who are pastors here, what is the number one question people ask you as soon as you say you have a church? How many? How many? Why? Not how mature? Well, that's difficult to measure. Yeah, nickels and noses are real easy to measure. It'll kill you. Leave here with your focus fixed on the author and perfecter of your faith, who is Jesus Christ. He's the producer. He's the director. Play your role. I'll leave you with this, and I, uh, my wife and I remind our kids of this often. Little kids in the house. You're very young. You're, you have a very easy life. I know it seems hard. Mom and dad have rules, and you have to follow rules. That's difficult, but it's really not difficult. Do this. Do it. Stop doing that. Stop. Don't do that. That's not allowed. Oh, don't think about it. When you start thinking about it, that, that starts the chain of events that's going to wreck your life, son, daughter. Hmm, mom says this, but boy, this seems awfully right in my own eyes. That's the problem. The problem is not the rules. The problem is the self-autonomy. I hope you are feeling blessed that you're at Trinity. I hope you grow in skill. I hope we keep churning out tremendous preachers, teachers, translators of Scripture. Don't, don't minimize it for fear of becoming a Samson. No. But just don't enter that place where you feel like all those skills and talents and gifts can manufacture ministry for you. Let Jesus do it and stick to the script. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your clear word that calls us out of where we are and into a place of obedience with you. We thank you for securing the way in which we can respond in obedience. And it's not just to muscle up. It's not to just uh, focus on our own skills and talent and obedience, our own ability to produce obedience, but instead to rest in you. And Lord, we trust that you will give us by your grace what we need to not become conceited. If it takes a thorn in the flesh, may it be so. But we pray that this would be a wake-up call for us, to not leave here depressed because our ministry doesn't look like someone else's, but that we would return to a place of joy in ministry if our ministries look like what you want it to be. If we're doing what you've asked us to do, may we be satisfied with what is right in your eyes. And would you center our faith in Jesus Christ alone? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.